There's a modern songwriter by the name of Joseph Habedank. And Joseph Habedank just recently wrote a song that says, Religion isn't working anymore. Religion isn't working anymore. I was thinking about that song that Joseph Habedank wrote. And I was thinking about Paul's testimony in Philippians chapter 3. Eventually we're going to be in Luke 6, but to introduce this passage, this message in Luke 6, I want you to go to Philippians chapter 3, what the Apostle Paul wrote beginning in verse 2. If there was a man that was trying to establish his own righteousness by keeping the law, it was the Apostle Paul. He said, if there's anybody that can boast or have confidence in the flesh, it was the Apostle Paul. But in Philippians chapter 3 and beginning verse 2, Paul gives a warning. He says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. He's talking about the group called the Judaizers who were coming in and telling new Gentile believers that trusting in Christ alone, you know, salvation by grace through faith alone isn't enough, that you have to keep the law, they, the, the men have to be circumcised and put themselves under the yoke of the law, of keeping the law. And so Paul was saying, beware of them, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But notice verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All those things I could put confidence in, I count as loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that, for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul says, all these things of uh, having a righteousness by keeping the law, I count that as loss of knowing Jesus Christ. And my desire is to grow in knowing Christ. Are you glad that you can know Almighty God? And he desires for you to know him in that growing relationship. John 17, 3, Jesus, before he goes to the cross, would pray. And he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Talking about the Father and him whom you sent, the Son to know by experience, to know personally, to know intimately, to know him at a growing knowledge. Friend, that's something that the Pharisees in Luke chapter 6 were missing. In Luke chapter 6, you have a group of Pharisees that are trying to watch Jesus closely to see which and, and how they may accuse him. They're basing 
their lives on a righteousness by trying to keep the law, and they've added to the law. They've added all these different things to define what it means to work on the Sabbath day. I, I have to tell you honestly that sometimes I find a gray hair. You know what I do? I pluck it out. The reason I mention that, the honest truth is, that was considered working on the Sabbath day. To pluck out a hair was working. And so Luke chapter 6, I want you to see, I wanted you to see that background that Paul was talking about a righteousness through knowing Jesus Christ. And when Paul could say, religion isn't working anymore. Luke chapter 6, the first point is, Jesus is what of the Sabbath? Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus has the authority. Who was the Sabbath made for? Man. He said the Sabbath was made for man. You know, our bodies, there's, our t there's time that we need to just flat out rest. I enjoy a nap on Sunday afternoon. Especially if I didn't sleep the best on Saturday night. And just to rest a little bit. That is the meaning of the word Sabbath. It's rest. And God designed that because man needs it. Man needs rest. So the Bible says in chapter 6, in verse 1, Now it happened that Jesus was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath. And his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. The disciples are doing that. They're plucking the heads out of the grain fields, and they're, they're eating it. The disciples in the, green, in the grain fields. Now, if you notice back in Exodus, or not Exodus, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, there's one verse that deals with this in the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 25, the Bible says, when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. So you can't go in and take a sickle and start hacking down the neighbor's grain, but what's it say you can do? What the disciples are doing. So they're not breaking the law, are they? But except when they're, what's the, the Pharisees upset about? The Sabbath. They're doing this on the Sabbath day. And so they're going to ask the disciples and the other gospels that record this, they've asked Jesus, and Jesus is going to answer. Some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Dr. A.T. Robertson in his word pictures of the New Testament, talking about the words here and, and the picture of this, this is one of the chief offenses. According to rabbinical notions, it was reaping, thrashing, winnowing, and preparing food all at once. What did they do? <laughs> they plucked some grain and rubbed it in their hands to eat it. But they, the Pharisees said, you're guilty of reaping, winnowing, and preparing food, for goodness sakes, on the Sabbath day. So we see the criticism of the Pharisees. But now we're going to see the teaching of the Savior. Jesus answers this. Jesus is answering them and said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? He and those were, were with him. 
1 Samuel tells us this, that David was running from King Saul, one of the times that he was running for his life. And there are men with David, and they are really hungry. It's not just a basis of missing a meal. They are hungry, and they come, and the priest, and what happens is they are given bread, the show bread, the, the bread in the very presence the, that was, that as the law said, that only the priest were to eat this bread. So Jesus said, did you, have you not read that when David did, when he was hungry and, and how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone and gave it to his companions? So you're going to condemn David? You're going to condemn David because of what he did in the midst of great need, necessity? And Jesus was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You've added all these extra regulations, traditions to the Sabbath. But what Jesus is doing is saying, you don't have that authority. You're not the Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is. And that's a title for deity from Daniel that Jesus would use many times for himself, the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the one who has the authority over this day. In chapter 5 and verse 20, remember when Jesus would heal the one that they lowered down before him, the paralytic. Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of the reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts, which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately, they, this is what the man did. And he was glorifying God. In verse 26, they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God and they were filled with fear, saying we have seen remarkable things today. But who was upset? The Pharisees. Who is this? And they were seeking to have something to accuse him with. Oh, Jesus, why are your disciples doing this? What is forbidden on the Sabbath day? So Jesus, and it's recorded for us, on another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. So Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Here is a man with a withered hand. It's a crippled hand. Now most people are right-handed, so this very well could have been the dominant side, the dominant hand. But here he is, he's, we're not told how long he's been this way, but <laughs> probably some time. And he's there in the synagogue. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching Jesus closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath. Why? The last phrase. So that they might have something to accuse him of. 
to, to accuse him. So the watching Pharisees, the word for watching here is they are watching intently to see what Jesus is going to do. Because here's a man that has a need. He has a withered hand. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. They're watching closely because they're thinking, um, if Jesus, and he knows that this man has this withered hand, he has the authority, he has the power to heal him. What's he going to do? And what are they all upset about? What day of the week is it? The Sabbath. Oh, one another regulations? Those that need to be healed, don't come to him on the Sabbath day. Come some other day to be healed. How foolish is this? But this is what they were doing. Friend, that was religion. They were basing a self-righteousness on the basis of, quote, keeping the law and even the traditions beyond the law and said, look at us, aren't you impressed with us because of how religious we are? Now other people might have been saying, oh, look at those Pharisees. You hear them pray in public, you hear them, see how they give and they let everybody to know how they're giving? Oh, look how religious they are. They have their long robes, they, they, they love their greetings. But what does Jesus say? He had some strong language in Matthew 23, the woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, you know, you have this outward appearance of righteousness. But the Lord knew their hearts. He said, they sing these songs or they say these words, but their heart is far from me. They're not drawn close to me. Now they're trying to accuse Jesus. They're watching. But notice the work of the Savior. Verse 8. They're at a disadvantage because you know what Jesus knows? He knows exactly what they're thinking. Verse 8. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, he's addressing the Pharisees that are having this thoughts of how they're going to accuse Jesus. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good? or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it. The very priest would have to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus is asking them the question, here is this man that has a withered hand. So is it right to do good? on the Sabbath day? Is it right to have that hand restored his health? This man on the Sabbath? After looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. Now what's the reaction of everybody that's there in the synagogue except the Pharisees that have gathered to try to accuse Jesus? Here is this man that had a need. He had a withered hand. And Jesus said, come forward. And he did. And Jesus commanded him, stretch out that arm and it was restored. There should have been joy. And I'm sure there was joy among others. There should have been amazement. Who is this? What power, 
What authority. But notice the wickedness of the Pharisees. They themselves were filled with rage. They're so caught up. How dare you do this on the Sabbath day? Who are you that you don't keep our, quote, regulations or added traditions to the law? They were filled with rage at Jesus. They should have been filled with joy. They should have fell down and worshipped him. But they discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Can you imagine them saying, what are we going to do with him? He goes around and does these miracles. And he questions us, saying, is it right is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? To do good or to do harm on the Sabbath day? He's questioning our religion. Religion. He's questioning our righteousness based upon keeping the law. This is the same thing that the Apostle Paul said. I count all these things as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. That pedigree, all those things of establishing a righteousness this way. He says, Paul says, you don't want to talk about a strict Pharisee? That's what I was. And the Apostle Paul thought he was honoring God by killing or by having the Jews or the, the Christians arrested and persecuting the church. He thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. Until Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Do you know Paul asked two great questions? You can see not only from Acts 9, but in Acts 26, and his testimony, and, and actually he gave his testimony before King Agrippa, and he would say, these two great questions was, who are you, Lord, and what would you have me to do? Who are you, Lord, and what would you have me to do? Those were two of the best questions that could have been asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Under religion, he thought he was doing right. But then he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. When we think about legalism, here's the reality. Legalism adds many extra commandments to the Bible to appear more spiritual. Legalism brings anger instead of rejoicing. Legalism has no mercy. Legalism leads to self-righteousness by keeping the law instead of acknowledging the need for the saving, enabling grace of Christ. You see... Legalism is still alive today. Do you realize that people can say and truly can hold to that salvation by grace through faith alone, but once they're saved, all oh, your growth in Christ is measured by all the externals, by all the things on the check marks of things that you can do. Do you realize that a person can do all sorts of things and not be growing in Christ? They can have the outward appearance, but 
God knows the heart, amen? A lot of times today what I'm seeing is you'll have groups that'll teach salvation by grace through faith just fine, but then once they become a Christian, oh, you're only growing, and the way you measure this is if you can check mark that you do all these things or don't do these certain things. And that guarantees you're growing in Christ. And no, it doesn't. Friend, the Apostle Paul didn't do that. He said his desire was to know Jesus Christ. When we think of all the things that's happening with the Sabbath, and when we think about all of this in light of religion and trying to have a righteousness based upon keeping the law. Listen to the words of Jesus before we have the invitation today. It's actually an invitation from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of the best invitations I can find in the scriptures. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30. I want you to see this. Jesus, in his invitation, says, come to me. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. What were the Pharisees doing? Adding all sorts of extra weights and all these regulations of trying to keep the law to establish some type of righteousness. And Jesus said, are you tired? Are you tired of religion? Are you tired of this basis of righteousness by doing instead of believing and just coming and trusting in me? The apostle Paul said, I got tired when I saw the reality. Here's all these things. But that didn't gain anything. I count it all as done or rubbish in light of knowing Jesus Christ. He would say, religion isn't working anymore. Jesus says, all who are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. You want rest for your souls? You want rest? You who are weary, heavy laden? Come to me. Aren't those glorious words? Come to the Savior. Come to Jesus Christ. He's the Lord and Savior. He didn't say come to religion. He said, come to me. Relationship with him. All who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you a rest. I love to hear when people will say, I just was carrying this heavy burden. I came to know Jesus and then just like that burden was lifted. We sing about that. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. All that heavy weight. Maybe you've tried to achieve various things in your own strength. You've tried to be, quote, good enough. You've tried religion. You've tried all these things. And Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. This is, in a sense, discipleship. To join in the yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. These religious teachers, they're burdensome. They've added all these things to you that you can't do. And it's causing all these heavy weights. But come and yoke up with me and learn of me. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wearsby wrote in his commentary about these three commands that summarize this invitation. The Pharisees all said, do, and tried to make the people follow Moses and the traditions, but the true salvation is found only in a person, Jesus Christ. To come to him means to trust him. This invitation is open to those who are exhausted and burdened down. That is exactly how the people felt under the yoke of Pharisaical legalism. The command take. This is a deeper experience. When we come to Christ by faith, he gives us rest. When we take his yoke and learn, we find rest, that deeper rest of surrender and obedience. The first is peace with God, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. The second is the peace of God, Philippians 4, 6 to 8. To take a yoke in that day meant to become a disciple. When we submit to Christ, we are yoked to him. The word easy means well-fitting. He has just the yoke that is tailor-made for our lives and needs. The burden of doing his will is not a heavy one. Learn. The first two commands represent a crisis as we come and yield to Christ. But this step is into a process. As we learn more about him, we find a deeper peace because we trust him more. Life is simplified and unified around the person of Christ. All oh, those are glorious words. Come to me. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, I remember that day when I listened and I said, I come to you, Jesus, believing, trusting in you alone because of what you did on the cross for me. But there's a possibility that even right here today, there's somebody here that is still carrying that heavy burden that hasn't responded to Jesus' invitation to say, come to me, trusting me, believing in me, and I'll give you what? Rest. Rest for your souls. Take up the yoke and learn of me. Friend, here's the reality. When you come to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, it doesn't mean that you have no more troubles. Boy, there's some that lie and say, oh, you'll never have any more problems. I don't know what Bible they're reading. Ask the apostles, how did they die? They were martyrs for Jesus Christ. But they said, we'll die in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know who empowered them to die in obedience to him? The Holy Spirit who came to indwell them, to empower them. That we learn of Christ because of the Holy Spirit teaching us. What a precious truth. Come to me. Where are you spiritually today? Do you have that rest? Are you learning of the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe you said, I started in the Christian walk. I, I started strong, but I've stumbled along the way. Here's great news. The Lord Jesus has never moved. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you say, I'm not as close to Jesus as I once was, he hasn't moved. But he invites you. He invites you to get back into fellowship with him. We're told in 1 John 1, 9 how to do that. The forgiveness that 1 John 1, 9 is talking about is forgiveness in the family, familial forgiveness. It's not with our salvation, but as children of God. Jesus taught this clearly. Remember as he washed the disciples' feet, 
And when Peter said, what are you doing? And you're never going to wash my feet. And the, Jesus says, unless I wash for you, you'll have no part with me. And, and Jesus, and, and the response to that, Peter says, well, don't just wash my feet. Wash me all over. Give me a bath. Isn't that what he was saying? <laughs> wash me all over. And, and Jesus said, no. You're all clean except one of you. And he was talking about Judas Iscariot that would betray the Lord. But in this world, your feet get dirty. He washed their feet. You're all clean, but your feet are dirty. Spiritually speaking, when we come to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we receive that forgiveness, that cleansing, that we are made clean. But living in the sinful world, guess what? Our feet can get dirty. And they do get dirty. It's not being washed all over again. It's not that bathing. But you know what? It's that cleansing. First John 1, 9, that when we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 2, 1 teaches us these things are written that you might not sin against God, but that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When we sin against him, he wants us back in restored fellowship with him. Maybe you're here today as a believer and say, I've been struggling spiritually, but the Lord loves me. The Lord loves me, and he said, come to me, take my yoke upon me, and upon you and learn from me. Will you heed to that today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus very strongly in Luke 6 confronts the hypocrisy of this legalism and self-righteousness and addresses the heavy burdens and bondage that this puts upon people. But Lord, you gave the glorious invitation and said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest for your souls. Take up the yoke. Learn from me. Lord, if there's somebody here that has never come to Jesus, carrying a heavy burden of sin, and they say, I'm bringing my self-righteousness and all these things that I've tried to achieve, bringing it to you, because I trust in you and you alone, because you went to the cross and died for me. You died in my place. You were buried, but you rose again the third day, just like you said you would. And like the Apostle Paul said, I count all those things as lost for knowing Christ. The very aspect of responding to come to Jesus. Oh, you know each heart, Lord, I pray that there's somebody here that needs to do that this day, that they would come to you. And I pray, O oh Lord, for the ones that have come to you and experienced salvation. But Lord, those that have struggled in their walk. And the Holy Spirit is bringing the light, sin, that needs to be confessed to you in the family. So that that fellowship can be restored. Of walking in the light as you are in the light. Have your way in this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.